you can smell that because there's a lot of fresh content <laughs> in this webinar and a bit of a different webinar today. Uh, we're going to set spectral cleanliness aside. I know it was very hard for us to do. Uh, you know, I talked to my therapist about it and said, you know, there is a webinar that's possible be, without talking about spectral clarity for an hour. We're going to set that aside for, for actually quite a few moments today. Um, and we're going to talk about Dia de los Muertos. You were like, wait, I showed up to the wrong webinar. No, the, today we're going to talk about tandem dyes and traditional dye variability and why that's had its day. And then we'll also come up with, with some useful checklists, I think, to, to frame, you know, I, honestly, items that have been pushed onto us as researchers that we should really say, hey, look, uh, vendor, are you doing this kind of testing? And so, so hopefully some useful tools in there as well. And then I'll use that as a bar to measure some of the things that we're doing because honestly, as scientists, we've also kind of had enough of some of this stuff. And so, uh, so, I'm, so I'm looking forward to going through those. So the, the three things that I wanna lay out ahead of time and do this using data is, is essentially, if you will, peel back the curtain on particularly tandem dyes for, for a moment. And then we'll also talk about traditional dyes. And we'll talk about their stability and variability, talk about consistency and this idea of dye to protein ratio or how we're conjugating polar force to antibody and all the impacts of that. And then we'll also spend a brief, piece of a brief point of time uh, talking about compensation um, as well. And so I think the first thing to cover on, on tandem dyes here, this is some, this is some data from, from Holden Maker and, and Joe Trotter. Um, and, and what they were looking at here was intracellular staining uh, when they were looking at CD4s and CD8s and, and also taking a look at what was occurring in terms of false positives that were occurring because of tandem dyes. And I wanna say that again, false positives in the biology because of the breakdown of tandem dyes. And so if you take a look at this for a moment, you know, they're skating on CD4s and CD8s here, you can actually see, for instance, that we see dim APC positive events in the population, right, that's actually positive for APC Psi7. And you also see dim PE positive events, right, in the population that's positive for PE Psi7, right? When we're using those as the phenotyping markers here, right? If we use PE Psi7 as a phenotyping marker, suddenly we get the presence of what appears to be IL2 positive cells. But in fact, these are not true cytokine producing cells. And there's two, there's actually several reasons why that, but the two most important of those is actually that these were not in it, they, they were not incubated with a secretion inhibitor. And the second one is actually that if you remove this and you do essentially a fluorescence minus one control, you actually see the false positives are completely gone when you don't even have APC Psi7 in there, right? And it's due to the breakdown there of APC Psi7 and APC. They're getting these false positives here. And you see the exact same thing for PE Psi7, right? If you remove the PE Psi7 from the equation, in a fluorescence minus one, you no longer see false positives. And I thought this was a really, I mean, this is from back in 2004, but, and, and there's more literature now that, that backs this up and we'll go through some of that, but false positives are associated, you know, are associated with the use of these tandem dots. Which I think is kind of scary, honestly. The, the second one that I found just as interesting was that you, there's actually a cell type dependent uh, uh, mechanism here where you actually see tandem degradation. And I thought this was really interesting and it was a bit of a surprise for me. Um, and, you know, I think despite, you know, some of the resolution the figures that they provide, I think what was really interesting here was they looked at both APC Psi7 and APC H7 tandem dyes, you know, both conjugated to anti-CD4, right? So there's really, you know, there's no, there's no magic there. This is an antibody that's, that's used all the time. And then what they did is they actually quantitated decoupling and looked at decoupling on different cell types. And so the first thing that you look at here, by the way, is, you know, this is just after 30 minutes of being attached two lymphocytes and they're actually quantitating again the decoupling you see a good amount of the percentage of decoupling you know approaching 20 percent here um you know for apc size 7 a little bit better in h7 but regardless you're seeing decoupling and then the intriguing thing they did is actually look at this cross cell types right and they said well actually as it turns out <laughs> you know we looked at both apc size 7 and apc h7 and you have both a tandem and a cell type specific degradation of these tandems right and so some cell types you know, perform better than others. But if you look at something like the PMNs populations, you're getting very, very high amounts of degradation. And you're getting it, I would also add, quite quickly, right? I mean, within 10 minutes of, uh, you know, having these on there, you're getting a large amount of decoupling and thus you're also getting false positives in the APC, right? And then you see a very similar thing with respect to these, to these monocyte populations where you get decoupling quite quickly, right? And so, you know, this, there's this body of literature now that's driving at tandem dye stability, um, just strictly, you know, and this is just in solution. The other one that I really like, and I've talked to Paul Wallace about, about this as well, and he always makes the joke that he's glad that you know, one person read his paper, but there's one really, I think, really nice piece of data in there that I really, really like. And it's a simple experiment, but it's one that also, that also proves the point 
about what we're talking about when we talk about tandem dye stability. And what they did quite simply was, you know, stain cells again with, with, with this CD45 APC uh, size seven and then put them in fixative and then either left them, you know, in, in you know, left them in the fridge uh, uh, with or without fixative, right? And all, all light protected, right? And so you're not getting light dependent degradation here. But what you see just after 72 hours, you're getting the degradation of APC size seven into APC, right? And so you get this increasing amount of degradation, right? And in fact, well, the other interesting thing that, you know, that they don't really highlight in the paper, but I find interesting from the point of view where we're just looking at with respect to decoupling is that in no fixative in four degrees in the dark, after 72 hours, you still have another, you have, you still have a false positive APC population, right? And so, you know, honestly, uh, uh, now an increasing body of literature that discusses this, and we'll cover some other aspects of this, but, I, you know, the, the stability of these tandem dyes, I think, is, is, a, is very much not just an open question, but it's something that we have to consider when we're, when we're doing our experiments. And we'll come up with a handy checklist for assessing this. The other part of this is consistency. So that's variability that's caused by tandem dyes and the fact that they just aren't very stable. The other thing I want to discuss here, though, too, is also what is the consistency of manufacturing when we actually take a look at tandem dyes? And so... For this section, I've actually, uh, 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 Trish Rogers from the Broad Institute was, was gracious enough to provide me with some data. This I'm actually using, if you will, as our negative control because this is a well, this is a well behaving antibody. And so what this is, they were running a, uh, a large sorting experiment um, over a course of six months for a, uh, for a lupus project. Um, and in this case, what they did is they actually would pull off data over the six months uh, and take a look just at the single stain controls and say, okay, what's the variability that's down, for instance, to the antibodies? And you can see, again, this is a, this is a good example, right? This is PD-1 PE, which honestly you wouldn't expect there to be any differences at all. This, you know, three different vials of antibody used from three different lots. And you can see that, you know, regardless even of them having a finer fiber bundle and the instrument replaced, a very consistent antibody. And honestly, this is what you should expect because it's just conjugated to PE. Now let's contrast that for a moment with a tandem dot. Same look in the universe, pulling data off of six months of running this trial. And just as you look across this, there's an enormous amount of variability, but it gets worse than that, right? And so in fact, this is a new vial of an antibody open that's of the same lot as the, the ones that were, that were, that were uh, open and used previously. So actually in this case, you're actually seeing not even just lot to lot variability, you're seeing vial to vial variability and run to run variability, right? And again, given some of the data that we showed you, Honestly, you, you would expect some of this, right? Based on the staining time, et cetera, right? But the fact is you're getting this, you know, getting this stochastic degradation of these tandem dyes and it's leading to this massive amount of variability, right? You still see this expected shift again with respect to the fiber bundle, right? And then this, this lot, you know, some of these, uh, the, the, these antibody lots were also, were, you know, were included in this BD Biosciences reagent recall, right? And so, you know, there's huge amounts of problems that are going on in these tandem dyes. And you're seeing, again, you're seeing lots of lot day to day, um, and, uh, and, and a large amount of variability that's, that's contributed really through these tandem dyes. And so, you know, as I was going through this, I realized that a lot of this variability and a lot of this stability really gets put on us when we're saying, okay, hey, you know, good luck, you purchased your antibody, now it's your problem. And it really is put on us as researchers to say, okay, well, now we've got to go vet that and look, and, and this is the point that Trish was making there, we're the ones looking at this, right? We're the ones looking at the shelf life stability, looking at the degradation of these not the vendors. And so I came up with a handy checklist that we'll also share, which is things that you should be asking. Your vendor, right? What is the shelf life stability of this? Have you tested room temperature stability? What's the fixative stability? Also in what types of fixative conditions? Do you see any spectral changes upon fixative? Also equally important is something that we'll bring back up today. And on consistency, I think this is also honestly a, a, an issue that um, you know, is, is pernicious and it's one that affects our, it, it, it creates a lot of variability, with, particularly with respect to the new polymer dyes. And I would encourage you to ask, can you share your lot to lot data for both conjugated antibodies as well as your floor force, right? Because if you're seeing a lot to lot variability, you know, there can be two contributors, obviously, it's the floor four and the antibody. Antibody manufacturer is pretty well understood, right? So if you're getting a lot to lot variability in your antibody, you, maybe you've got bigger problems. Where the large contribution, at least that we see when it looks at lot to lot variability, when we look at bringing in conjugates from other vendors, it's down to the floor for it. And so again, that's something that we'll tackle. The other thing too is, do you see any vial to vial variability? Which sounds kind of crazy, but at the same time, you should be asking your vendor this. And again, to the point, I will use these questions. And I will ask us, hey, Phytonics, what, what, how do you perform on these items? 
I think the final item though to bring back up is one that is a, is a civil one. It's all it's one that we take for granted. But the fact is, is it's an enormous headache and that is with respect to tandem dies and compensation, right? And it's based on this rule and those of us who are on the cytometry for do list know and can recite this by heart, right? Which is that when you use any tandem antibody conjugates, you must compensate using that exact same tandem conjugate. Why is that? It's because when you conjugate that tandem to the antibody, it actually changes the fluorescence characteristics of it, okay? And so I think that that's really interesting, but it's also something that we're just like, oh, well, we just have to put up with that now, right? And so in the practical terms, right, we have to stain cells that have low frequency or low antigen density. We have to use beads um, and we have to hope that all goes well, right? And what's interesting here, by the way, is that it's not only just that, right? It's actually that, and I thought this was a great resource from the University of Iowa. It's that this tandem dye from BD doesn't equal this tandem dye from biologic from compensation, right? Oh, and by the way, you know, obviously the two different specificities those also aren't equivalent. The two different lots, those aren't consistent either, right? Uh, the one that is, that is a, that's even the same lot, but one that's fixed, yeah, that's not the same either. Um, and the one that you just purchased that's on the same antigen and on the same tandem versus the one that's one month old, yeah, you can't compensate that either using that. I, I'm actually speechless, which is a, which said can share is a rare occurrence. This is something we've just been putting up with right, for years in the field. It's unbelievable to me that, that that's, that's an acceptable mode of operation. And so we'll discuss too how we can change this fundamentally. You should be able to compensate, right, any dye that can fret, for instance, on CD4 or any antigen that, that you expect. But honestly, if you look at these rules, it shows you what we're talking about with respect to tandem dye stability and tandem dye variability, right? So those are three, I would, I'd argue quite large issues with respect to, to tandem dyes. Well, why do we still use them? You know, they're great at one thing. Tandem dyes are really good at fretting, right? Obviously we were just fretting for a good, you know, 16 minutes about tandem dyes, but now, or a little bit less, sorry, 10 minutes about tandem dyes, but they're very good at, at providing fluorescence for energy, energy transfer, right? And giving us access to more wavelengths. And, and you know, with that respect, there really has been, I, explosion I think is probably overstating. I, you know, I just get excited. Um, you know, there's really been a, a large expansion in the number of tandem dyes particularly as, as folks have attempted to step further out into the red or fill in gaps on spectral. And regardless, every tandem dye is going to suffer from all of the problems that I just discussed. And to that point, you know, uh, you know we've, got, we've got kids who are all in virtual. And so, you know, I figured that they needed a report card, right? And so do tandem dyes. So this is my tandem dye report card. Okay, and again, we'll use this for the Nova floors in a moment. Tandem dyes, they break down leading to false positive events. They break down and fix it a solution. They exhibit day-to-day, vial-to-vial, and lot-to-lot -lot variability, also their pain to compensate. Also traditional dyes, and this is another important point that we'll bring up, must be conjugated to mole, antibodies at molar excess, which drives cost and can also lead to the presence of free dye in solution, for instance, when you're doing something off of a custom program, and have a Poisson distribution of dyes on a protein. And again, I'll bring it back um, some items to discuss about this, but I want to frame up where we're starting. By the way, we haven't even started talking about cross-excitation and spread here. We still haven't mentioned it, right? As I mentioned, I promised that I wasn't gonna talk much about it. So to that end, let's juxtapose that for a moment and say, okay, we're fed up with all those issues with respect to tandem stability, tandem consistency, tandem variability, right? And this pain of compensation. So now what do we do with that? So I'm gonna talk about stability. I'm gonna share some new data on stability testing, both on labels, the labels themselves that we've made, as well as the conjugated antibodies. I will also take a look at spectral stability, which is a question that's come up that we, we were able to answer now for both room temperature and fixative stability, because I think it's equally important. That's a question that I think is, was honestly a really important one for people to be asking, and, and so we've answered that. We're also, gonna, we're also gonna call Poisson control. I couldn't resist a pun there. And then we'll also just talk about hassle-free compensation and what you can do with those, right? But the focus will be particularly on stability and variability, and then we'll talk a little bit around what we're doing to control the, the degree of labeling and then what the implications of that might be. You know, we've shown in previous webinars the fact that our, the labels are bright and clean, right? That we're, we have this uh, spectral hygiene, which, I, which I've heard uh, someone mention it. Uh, we'll talk about consistency stable quite a bit, and then we won't have time to talk about digital fluorescence. But just know as I walk through this, that because more than 90% of the mass of our each label is DNA, as we'll discuss, that the data that I'm showing, which I'll show you for a number of different labels, really applies to the whole family of these floors. And I think that's what gets really exciting when we think about both the stability and the consistency, but also applications you can go after, right? Are the mandatory phyton, phytonic slide, how do we do any of this? Um, so we take 
uh, small organic dyes, bind them onto oligonucleotides, and then they can assemble, and actually they self-assemble into this phyton structure. And that's what enables us to fine tune engineering platform, which we can choose both the components and then the geometry in the case that we want these dyes you know, to fret with one another. And so again, the big distinction here is that while we are leveraging fret, these are clearly not tandems. And so we'll put that, if you will, in the ground in several different ways, right? And that's why I think this juxtaposition with tandem dye stability is so, so important and hopefully gives you some things to both look for in tandem dyes, regardless of your application, as well as things to ask your vendor because putting that back on us as researchers is frankly not acceptable. Um, and finally, we, this also provides the flexibility that you can conjugate this now to an antibody. So this is, you know, ask us, right? We're a vendor too, I keep saying we. Um, I guess I'm we on both sides of this, but ask us, let's answer these questions. What is the shelf life stability, room temperature, fixative, spectral, lot to lot data and viable file variability? Let's answer those questions, right? Let's actually do it with data and let's share all of that openly. And then that way you can go back to other, other vendors and say, can you show me what you're doing here? So the first part of this is stability. So the first experiment that I'll show you here, and again, we've got a whole menu of experiments here that I wanted to really show and, and reveal what we've been, been looking at with respect to stability, is the first one is actually two months storage for just the phyton labels themselves, right? And so this is just, you know, we've made the, the fluorescent labels, uh, they were stored in a fringe, and then two months later, we, we pulled them back out, conjugated them to CD4 and then tested them, right? And so the question is, you know, were they, were they stable and, and did they perform? And the answer is yes. So they, they emit, uh, across the blue, exactly as we would expect. You can actually see we've got a little bit of background in this Nova Blue 530. These are stained without without any kind of without any blocking solution in there. But otherwise, you know, we're, we're you know, but the, the, the lack of background across Nova Blue 610 and 660 looks quite good, and we're getting exactly the fluorescence, honestly, that we would that we would uh, uh, expect off of the blue and off of the yellow, right? So the labels themselves are 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 stable in a fridge for at least. At least two months. Obviously, as you can tell, in all of these, of course, we're intending to test out longer, or, or currently have that in process. Across all three of the Nova yellows, you see, you know, very, very low background. You're not getting an increase in background when you're just leaving the leaving the labels in there and performing conjugation at a later date. Um, and they're performing spectrally exactly as as we would expect. So the the labels themselves are are quite stable. And honestly, you would expect this because you know the DNA structure is very, very rigid. Right, and it's also quite hydrophobic. So in fact, it's just keeping it in solution. I'd say too, the other, other point that I think we're taking for granted here is that the labels were left right um, in, in that solution for two months and we don't, see, we don't see aggregates, right? In fact, we've never have seen aggregates when we're performing these kind of testing or doing large, larger stainings or performing you know, master mix testing. The second experiment here was, okay, what about two weeks of room temperature just for the phyton label itself, right? And so again, this is actually pushing the label itself, we, we, you know, we previously shared some data, which I'll expand on today about conjugating antibodies, but can you just leave the, the label itself, you know, out on a bench? And so we tested this and then and pulled off aliquots at, at day seven and day 14. And again, just looking at the label itself. And you can see that in fact, there's actually no change anywhere in the spectrum for the label itself for at least out to two weeks. Again, we need to test a little bit longer, but I think it just, it goes to show that, you know, that that label you know, due to its structural stability is just incredibly clean. The next experiment here is one that I wanna expand on. It's one that I've shown before, but I wanted to take a look to address some questions around spectral stability. And so the question here was, you know, in contrast to the way the tandem dives perform in fixative, where you get this breakdown of APC size seven into APC after 72 hours, can we check that? And can we check that much, much longer, um, right? So we actually test, tested this um, after after two weeks, right? And they, again, the, the setup of this experiment is that cells were left into this 2% paraformaldehyde solution for two weeks. They weren't fixed and then resuspended in PBS. And so the data that I've shown before, and again, we're looking here at phyton uh, antibody conjugates. The data that I've shown before is, yes, we have the ability to stay in CD3 cells, so gold star um, in PBMCs. But the more important experiment here is that uh, if you look at fresh compared to two week fix, that there's no difference in the fluorescence, right? So you can literally leave these in fluorescence. And the question that kept coming up that we finally answered is, well, what does it look like spectrally? Does, are there any changes when you look at this across, across the spectrum? So what we've done now is taken both of the, the fix and the fresh, and now I'm, I'm breaking this out. This is all run on an attune, right? And so, you know, instead of looking at this on a spectrum, we're looking at it in application and said, okay, fine, let's take a look at that across all the detectors that we have access to, the three in the blue, the four in the yellow, the three in the red, and the four in the, in the, uh, in the violet. And in fact, what you see is, well, what you're not seeing, right? 
there are really no changes with respect to the spectral stability of these dyes in fixative. So they can be left in fixative and they can be, they can be run and then they're, they're gonna be bang on consistent now or later when you're looking at this across the spectrum. So I think equally as important if you're running conventional flow because then you can count on you know, what the compensation is and still having this, this low characteristic, having very, very low spillover spreading error, right? Which is really the, well, the, the signature of our dyes, but you can also count on, on the spectral stability, right? So if you're doing this and running it on Aurora after fixing it, the spectrum and the signatures are gonna be the same uh, on cells. And so, so again, I'll actually bring this back up in a moment too, when we look at room temperature stability across a very, very large set of labels, because in this case, we're just using Nova Yellow 610 as an example label. So to that end, let's look at room temperature stability. And this was one that, you know, we really have, we've shared part of the, some of the, the analysis we've done before, but I've really blown this out and said, okay, well, let's, let's really show everything that we can look at with respect to room temperature stability and the types of stability testing that we, uh, that we like doing. And so again, we're looking at antibody con that are conjugated to our Nova floors, right? These are just conjugated and stored at four degrees. So they're stored in a fridge or they're literally stored in a lab bench drawer under tin foil. That's it, there's no magic there. And they're not stored for all of these experiments. There's no special buffer storage solution. They're stored in PBS, right? This is actually, you know, all these are actually in PBS even without AZI, right? So it's just PBS. Um, so there's no special buffer to prevent aggregation and we're not doing any, there's no magic, right? It's all down to the stability of, of what we're able to do, uh, both on the, on, the, on the side of the Nova floor and then also on the side of what we're doing to conjugate to antibodies, again, which we'll describe in a minute. The data that I've shared before is this, right? Which is that across, you know, this set of conjugates that we've made for all six of our first blue, yellow, green labels to CD4, that we saw no difference with respect to the fluorescence for those that are stored in the fridge or those that are stored at room temperature. But honestly, we've taken this a few, a few steps further. And so how, how much further? So the point is, is actually what we wanted to do is look at this over a time course, right? And if you remember, one of the reasons we want to look at this kind of going, if you will, going back to some of the data we saw earlier with APC size seven is, well, what, what does this look like, right? What if we could look at this day to day, right? What if we could see what this looks like and see if there's any variability? And so this is actually looking at four degrees versus room temperature across all six of these first six BYG labels but looking at it at day zero, four, seven, 11, and 14, right? And in this case, what we're looking at is actually median fluorescence intensity versus time, right? And we can see that we're very consistent in MFIs over, over time here when we're, when we're having these, these time points. Again, we took that another step further, right? And so what we wanted to do was also, because that's just the median fluorescence intensity of the positive population, but the, the alternative argument could be, well, good enough, but what, ha what, what happens if you get degradation and you're actually increasing the background of the negative? Okay, fair point. So what we did there, and, and you, people that have been looking at some of the things that we've been putting out know that we're very fond of separation index, and I thought it was actually worth putting, pulling in a slide on this, is the reason that we use separation index is because it accommodates for the, it accounts for the 84th percentile of the negative population. So if you have a good, you know, if you've got a good medium fluorescence intensity and it's very consistent, that's great. But you could also be bringing up the background, as I mentioned. The separation index will account for that, right? And say, look, it really is, it's down to the separation of the, the background population and the positive population. I was on the phone, you know, with a customer yesterday and he said, look, you know, I think one of the reasons that we really are excited to use these floors and put them in is not just this filler spreading error, but it's also because they ex exhibit lower background staining, right? And so they give us that good separation, which is the, the in our minds, the better measure better measure of like true brightness. But to that point, what we did is actually look at these separation indices over time. So not just the median fluorescence intensity, looked at that for the CD4 conjugates across all six of these labels. And again, you see incredible consistency, right? So again, measured at day zero, four, seven, 11, and 14. We are just not seeing differences with respect to separation index. So we are also, while we're maintaining our brightness and the expectation there, we're also not increasing the background. So I think equally uh, important data points to consider. And again, something you should be asking your vendor for, what does this look like over time? Not just stability over time, but talk to me about increases in background and signal intensity. The other thing that, that was a corollary of the question I asked earlier around these, this notion of fixative stability was what is this spectral stability? And I, I like considering this concept because it has huge, huge impacts on Conven again, conventional cytometry or spectral cytometry. In conventional cytometry, well, it's clearly going to, I mean, if you have a degradation in a floor, you're going to get unexpected results. You're going to get false positives, you're going to get an increase in spillover spreading error, or you're going to get changes that you don't expect. 
And in the spectral world, you're not gonna get a change in that signature. So you've got to know that the that the spectral that the spectrum is is stable under these these different conditions. So again, comparing four degrees and room temperature, and I'll actually take you through all six of these colors actually and show you the spectral stability for these. And again, just in this case, comparing day zero and day 14, if you will, the bookends of, of this experiment. Um, or sorry, I shouldn't say that. It's those that were stored at four degrees and those that were uh, at room temperature for two weeks. So you can see, right, Nova Blue 530, no changes across the spectrum. The story is exactly the same for Nova Blue 610, right? And in fact, again, it's one of these plots of like what you're, so this is like a strangest presentation. It's like what you're seeing is what you're not seeing. And that's because they're overlaid on each other. There are no differences in across the spectrum. Again, looking at this on an attunement. Same thing for Nova Blue 660, right? Where we're just not seeing, uh, we're not seeing changes there. Nova Yellow 570, you can see that again, these look like overlays and that's because they're, they're very spectrally stable. The story is the same for Nova Yellow 610 and 660, right? And so, you know, incredibly interesting in the sense that like we have this spectral stability. So, you know, again, bringing up this ask your vendor, what's your shelf life stability? I, hopefully we've addressed that question. Um, you know, have you tested room temperature stability? Yes, quite a bit. Uh, what's the fixative stability? Well, you can leave it in a fixative for at least two weeks. Are there spectral changes on fixative or room temperature stability? No. So I encourage you to ask them on other dyes, particularly on tandem dyes. So then remember bringing this back up and holding myself to the standard, can you share your lots of lot data for both conjugated antibodies and fluorophores? Yes. Um, <laughs> and so, so we've shown this before, but I want to dive a little bit deeper into, into what we're on about here and then how we test this on conjugated antibodies as well. And then I'll, I'll loop this back in when we talk about what we're doing for both uh, antibody printing as well as the, the, our, our customs program, which we're supporting now and have a number of customers using is, you know, what about consistency? And so it's interesting because I sent this to another manufacturer yesterday and they said, that's really impressive. We couldn't get anywhere close to that. Right. And, and what we're showing here is that our spec, our engineering spec is to have less than 5% variability anywhere in the spectrum on the labels themselves, which as I noted earlier is, is a huge contributor to the variability that you're seeing in between uh, lots a lot on your antibodies. I would say particularly with respect to, to some of the polymer dyes that you're using, something that we've seen, something that other customers are, you know, have begun sharing data with us on. Nova Yellow, you just don't see any differences between our manufacturing lots. You can see actually Nova Blue 530 is actually within instrument variability. But again, if we have something that is more than 5% different, we will just throw it out. We just, that's not acceptable to us, right? And so to take this a step further, what we did is actually take both of these manufacturing lots, conjugate them to C4, and then sent them out to Steve Perfetto at, at the National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Disease and said, can you please also test this? And again, we're using the measure of separation index. So again, it's not just about the, oh, we're hitting the same medians, yay, like we're done. No, it's also about have we also maintained non increase in the background? And the answer is yes. And so this was actually run across a, a set of titrations for the three Nova yellow dyes, as well as I'll show you the three Nova blue dyes. And there's no statistically significant differences with respect to separation indices. So again, when I say that, it's like, oh yeah, of course, but let's break that out. It means, again, going back to this, we're not changing the signal intensity, right? And we're also not changing the background. So if you have a very consistent instrument, this, these should be absolutely consistent, right? Across lot to lot, right? And so we're controlling the floor for lot to lot uh, issue and, and hopefully making that a thing of the past. Same thing that we see off the Nova Blues. So again, the reason I bring this back up is because you know, again, you'd be hard pressed to, to find some, lot, some, some public lot to lot data from your other vendors. Go and ask, right? Um, we certainly do. And I think we, we receive silence in response, but you know, it's a little bit different. This shouldn't be put on us to say, hey, look, there's lot to lot issues. It should not be on the customer to go back and report lot to lot issues and then try to find what the line of causation is there, right? And in fact, it's something that we shouldn't be dealing with at all. And so we've been public around saying, look, this should be a thing of the past. This should not be a contributor to variability. Okay, speaking of variability, the first seminar I gave on any of this technology was really interesting because I brought out a point and it was a, a, a huge surprise. One, to me when I was looking at it because I guess I was inside of Plato's cave and just had no idea with respect to how antibody conjugation was working down in, in the details. But it was also a surprise to my audience. And so they asked me to actually walk through this, this part a little, bit, a little bit more slower next time I presented it. And I haven't brought it back up because, because we've been working very, very hard on solving it. And so the issue here is, is and I call this Poisson control somewhat tongue in cheek as, you, as you're probably getting used to, 
but it's the it's the issues that we have with respect to conventional con conjugation. So again, I want to spend a moment here because you know someone said, whoa, 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 hold on. It was like they blew a whistle. Like, hold on, so explain this again, right? And I think it's an important point. In conventional conjugation, and this applies to all the dyes that we're using now, the tandem dyes, traditional dyes, polymer dyes, you name it. Excess fluorophore is added, right? And so this can be five to one, it can be 10 to one, right? And, and you are applying that molar excess of dye essentially to drive up, right, the efficiency and also the degree of labeling that you get onto this antibody as it attaches to this antibody. The unreactive fluorophore must be removed, although there's a caveat there. There are certain programs like customs programs where they'll send it out without purifying. And so you'll have free dye in solution, right? And so I've seen data where there's actually free dye in solution there. And again, it's because of this excess that is added and it results in a spread of what people either refer to as dye to protein ratio. How much dye do I have on a protein or what we refer to as degree of labeling. And in fact, this is a quote, you know, from, from a manufacturer's website around what it talks about. Well, the typical FTP ratio is three to seven to one. Wow, that's a pretty broad range, right? What does that actually mean? So other than PE and the PE conjugates, because PE is quite large, 240 kilodons, right? It's enormous. And so generally speaking, you only get one PE on one antibody. All the other dyes that we're talking about really have this distribution of an FTP ratio of three to seven to one, or sometimes a little bit, a little bit more. What's important that's wrapped up in that is that there's variability before we ever even stain the cells. And in fact, as you can tell here, it's also not known, right? You, and they cannot guarantee, okay, this only has five of those dye proteins on that antibody. And in fact, what you see is there ends up being a Poisson distribution of the labels on this antibody, right? And in fact, I've had the other piece of this is that because that's not well controlled, obviously this can be quite a large distribution, right? Three to seven is, an, is a very large distribution. And frankly, that affects the brightness, right? So if you think about three versus seven, when you have any kind of the any any kind of dye, that's a large window of, of variability. And again, that's variability that you have before you ever get on to the instrument. There's another, I think, critical point in here. It means fundamentally that you can't use antibodies like that to quantitate. Anything that you do is going to be relative. It's going to be relative expression. You can't say it has this number of receptors because you have this kind of variability with respect to the number of dyes that you're measuring. So in contrast, Think about what we have just on the side of the floor for, for a moment. We have a known number of dyes and a known brightness on that phyton structure, right? And everything that is in one tube, for instance, of Nova Blue 530 is Nova Blue 530, right? We perform post purification. There's no free oligos in there. Everything that's in there is Nova Blue 530. And moreover, is Nova Blue 530 at its specified brightness level, because obviously we can actually ch ch change, you know, the brightness level, but when we change certain components of that label, right? So everything in there is Nova Blue 530, known number of dyes, known brightness, known spectral profile. And so one of the things that we were aiming for and now have accomplished is can we do one-to-one -one conjugation on this antibody? Can we get one phyton with a known amount of dye onto one antibody, move away from this Poisson distribution and really tackle a large number of problems all at once, right? Which is one, the presence of free dye and excess dye, the fact that you really don't have to remove excess fluorophore, that you don't have a spread in the degree of labeling and thus you could use them for quantitation. And so the contrast here would be, you know, you go from a Poisson distribution to a really highly controlled number of labels or dyes, right? And so you, in many ways, right? I mean, you, you know, you're gonna have, the goal here would be to take that distribution that's Poisson and make it essentially, you know, in a, in a, in a perfect world, it would be all be one-to-one -one that was in that too, right? And so that's actually what we're doing. And again, it's something the technology that I'll bring back up in a moment when we discuss antibody printing. But this is what we're leveraging now actually for all of our conjugated antibodies. And it also gives us the ability now to essentially take any color on any of the conjugates that we offer or conjugates that we can get access to and essentially print them out on a new color, but do it in this way that is one-to-one. -one. Hassle-free compensation. This is actually one that honestly doesn't require much in the way of, of data or discussion, luckily, because, because of the, the structure of the phyton, they're actually incredibly easy to compensate because they do not change upon conjugation to an antibody. That's it. So you can compensate them on CD4 or CD8 or any other marker that you want to for a given color. And they're going to compensate for the rare cell marker or the dim cell marker. That's it. <laughs> and we're doing that all the time. We compensate on CD4 across all the different things that we've shown in our 40 color experiments and, and what we're working on now, 45 colors. 
So it's pretty simple, actually. So again, contrasting to, to tandem dyes, nanofloors, well, they don't break down. There's a rigid DNA backbone. They're spectrally and chemically stable at room temperature, man, and fixative. We just need to test out just how long that is. There's less, to, less than 5% variability on the lot-to-lot -lot by design. They're easy to compensate because it's just trivial. By, I mean, it's a by definition issue. No molar excess of dyes needed. You get a precise degree of labeling. And I'll show you again what we're doing when, now that we've got this ability to do one-to-one -one labeling. And again, to the point we've actually leveraged this compensation ability when we've run our experiments. We can compensate on CD4 and use them on chemokine receptors or other rare cell markers or variable cell markers, right? It's not, this isn't an issue, right? Um, and leveraging the spectral clarity, we're able to do this and do it very faithfully. You know, to the point, uh, this, this slide's actually a, a, a what, a, a 32 hours out of date now set in, but I think it shows, you know, that you are able to do these experiments, but you're not having to worry about compensation controls as an issue. You're not have to worry about, you know, tandem dye stability in the case that we're going in and replacing, you know, these labels and we're leveraging the spectral clarity to get it done. But of course, as you can imagine, as you look across, you know, this panel, we still have some work to do, right? And the work to do is to replace these, these tandem dyes. Um, you know, it's certainly, you know, particularly out further into the red across these lasers, right? Remove those tandem dyes, remove that tandem dye variability, right? And then obviously go after as well the violet and the UV laser. You know, another point here too, actually just about tandem dyes while we're on it, <laughs> is uh, some of them are incredibly sticky, right? And so our dyes exhibit some of the stickiness as well. I think it's actually the only thing that some of our dyes share with tandem dyes is some of the stickiness that you observe on monocytes. And so we've created a blocking solution to be able to, to handle that. But to the point, it actually handles the stickiness that you see with the side-based tandems as well. And so I thought it was useful to share that, you know, this is something that we add before staining. Um, we've actually, again, characterized this actually across all of the, the side-based tandems here, right? And in this case, we're looking at is orange is no block, blue is the phytonics nova block, and then yeah, uh, red is the spilage and true stain, you know, monocyte blocker. And what we see is that we can limit the background, right? That we see specifically, in, you know, these, in these, these leukocyte populations that we think is contributed most from monocytes binding onto these dyes. But we're able to limit that for all of these side-based tandems using our blocking solution as well. So if you must use tandems, and, you know, honestly, at this point, we're having to use some as well. It is what it is. You can still use the blocking solution to get rid of some of this background, right? And to prove that out, you know, a little bit more rigorously, here we're taking a look at CD14 on the x-axis and a number of side-based tandems on the Y, and you can see this orange population is what we're talking about with respect to this monocyte-driven background, but we're able to limit that really, really well with the Phytonics Nova block population. And in fact, it's this blocking through line, if you will, that's now enabled us to, to updose block and then show that we're able to get into the cell, right? So we're getting on lymphocytes here, um, looking at a positive control for interferon gamma P, Dazzle, so we can perform cytokine staining here. But now we're also able to show, even though we're not up at saturation, that we are able to use these floors for, you know, for intracellular staining. So again, I think critically important because, you know, certainly can't use tandem dyes for these kind of applications because they just can't put up with that kind of abuse. Um, and also, as we showed earlier, you, you run the risk of, of having quite a few false positives. And they also spill over quite, quite badly. So now you've got a spectrally clean, incredibly stable floor for that's been optimized with respect to background that can get into the cell and stain cytokines and do multiplexing in the cell. And furthermore, not only can it do this opponent-based permeabilization fixation regime, but now we can also do the, uh, you know, methanol based and, and get into the nucleus as well. And so it leads us down the path of considering what multiplexing means there. Again, looking at here, the positive control Fox P3 PE, I note here actually that the positive population here is only just a tick above 10 to the four. What's really interesting about this platform as well, when we look at this, our anti-Fox P3 Novi Yellow 610, is we're actually getting two different populations of Fox P3 staining, which is actually what the biology, you know, would tell you that you should expect because there actually are FOXP3 low and FOXP3 high Treg populations. So we're actually seeing that very bright staining in the high populations in the way that you just cannot pull out based on PE because again, PE is quite large. So I think this is actually down to the physics of access of, of this antibody and this floor. And again, as I mentioned, all these issues with respect to application, whether beginning into the cell or performing very large extracellular stainings, the types of stability and consistency that we've talked about, that applies to our entire menu. Again, more than 90% of the mass of this is, is DNA. And so we can upset the apple cart, if you will, of tandems, um, change the game of, 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 of what lot to lot consistency really should be, because it, it should we shouldn't have to worry about that. And it applies across every floor that we do. As I've also mentioned, we are very active in the UV and violet space. So hopefully more on that soon, really, you know, looking at probably beginning of next year before we, you know, show 
uh, what what we're up to there. But then, you know, again, when we land in a laser line, it's it's you know, it's with three or four floor or four. So, so it takes some doing. The one to one labeling now has not only been you know essentially sh we we we've shown that we can get one to one labeling right, and they're actually generating a data packet for for that now. But furthermore, we've actually deployed this for all the conjugated antibodies that we offer now. So we have a set of recommended colors across the clones that we have. Um, but also we've got the ability because we store these clones um, that are polynucleotide modified, we actually have the ability to print any color that we have that's in stock on any of these in stock antibodies, right? And so we can actually order that up and essentially do that within a matter of days. Also what's really interesting about this and it's enabled us to deploy a, a very fast customs program is we can, as long as we can get access to an antibody, we can actually put them into this printing regime, right? And then be able to print those out and be able to do that on a one-to-one -one basis. So again, you have actually the opportunity to have quantitative flow cytometry on those antigens, right? And do it in this printing modality and do it quite quickly. So that, you know, hopefully I've, I've talked a little bit about stability and, and answered some more questions around spectral stability. I think in particular is something that is, is very new, d d dove a little bit deeper into the room temperature stability talked a little bit about Poisson control um, and, and how we're dealing with that, at least from the point of view of manufacturing and then hassle-free compensation. So, so that a uh, hopefully concise, but a little bit different, uh, uh, different webinar, different take on, on what we should be doing. And, uh, and, and we'll definitely be uh, posting up the checklist of things to ask your vendor. So, so with that said, and I'm happy to discuss, take any questions, maybe Sen, you know, Sen might also have several questions here because some of this was new to her. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, I, I know that um, we've got continuing to build out this, you know, stability data. So that'll be exciting for Mike to be 